Let's get into our lesson here. Last week, we continue to build a foundation for a belief in divine healing. The series has two objectives, which you should know probably by heart by now. The first is to demonstrate that developing faith for divine healing is biblical, practical, and beneficial. The second is this, to foster reasonable expectations for divine intervention in the healing and recovery of your physical body, to have an expectation. And I, I told you last week we were going to get to the woman of, uh, with the issue of blood, which I kind of alluded to, I've been alluding to. Um, we're not going to get to her this week, uh, but, I, but we will get to her, I promise. But I keep bringing her up because this, she had expectation. She had expectation. And why aren't we getting to her this week? Because there is still foundation that I'm laying. And the importance of this is this, that people have an idea around uh, this concept of divine healing. It's usually, they usually see it presented by people who are making claims on television, making, you know, uh, uh, about, about being healed, Jesus, by Jesus stripes I'm healed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all fine. But th- to really grasp healing from the Lord, you need the foundation. The foundation is Jesus. And I think my iPad is talking to me, so I need to tell it to, that it's... <laughs> All right, it thinks I'm talking to it, so uh, that's okay. Uh, Alexa is saying amen. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. Alexa saying amen. But, uh, but, but my point is this, that, that we need to have a foundation for these claims about healing. If, it, if it's just cliches, if it's just, you know, saying popular phrases that we hear from conferences and the, the person of Christ isn't resonating in our heart and who he is revealed in the word resonated in our heart, then it, it'll just be phrases and we're not going to see the results that we're looking for. So receiving divine healing has everything to do with seeing Jesus clearly. Seeing Jesus clearly. Clearly, the woman with the issue of blood, again, we haven't talked about her yet in terms of looking, unpacking the Scripture, but she had a clear vision of Jesus. For this woman to risk what she risks, uh, to go out into society, it was, (laughs) she had to quarantine. She was supposed to quarantine. She was not supposed to be out in public with her blood issue. The law indicated, the Jewish law indicated that she was not supposed to do that, but she risked all those things because she had cultivated the reality that if she even, not even just touched him, but touched his garment, that she would receive healing. She was only able to do that because even though she had, she, she, it, it was a minute before she could see him physically, she was able to see him clearly. I argue, I, I suspect that it was through the scriptures. And we'll get into that. So, so receiving divine healing has everything to do with seeing Jesus clearly, but check it out. Seeing Jesus clearly has everything to do with seeing the word clearly. We talked about that last week, the way Jesus was pointing to his disciples who he was resurrected, but they weren't really clear about whether that was the truth or not. And he revealed himself to them, but even then there was some, uh, some unbelief. And so in, in, we saw two instances of this in the book of Luke. And what does he do? He points them to Scripture. He points them to Scripture to remedy their unbelief. So seeing Jesus clearly has everything to do with seeing the word clearly. So let's put this all together, right? Number one, we look intently at the word to see Jesus. Number two, we look intently at Jesus to see who God is. Number three, among many other things, God is a healer. And number four, once we see God as a healer, we can have the faith to be healed. Do you see that? Okay. We got to develop some habits. There are people who have a, well, they have expectations to be healed, but they don't dig deep into the Scripture. They're not nourishing themselves on the Word. We referenced it last week, but Jesus at the festival in John chapter 7 was saying, He that believes on me as the Scripture has said. He that believes on me as the Scripture has said. The Scripture is vital. And the people that I've observed 
who have experienced divine healing on a, on, with some kind of regularity are people who are deeply embedded in the Scripture, feeding on the Scripture, meditating on the Scripture. And so that focus, that reality is, is, the, is the focus of today's message. We learned last week that Jesus is emphatic. We can cultivate faith in him from the Scripture. To see Jesus in the Scripture, we must go beyond the surface. We can't be content with the preacher going deep while we remain shallow. There are a lot of people comfortable with that. They say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a preacher. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I, I didn't graduate from seminary. I'm not a preacher. I'm just a, I'm just a, you're just a what? What does it mean precisely that you're a follower of Jesus? That you are shallow in your understanding of the word? That you spent 30 years of your life going to church and you know very little about the scripture and you're proud of that? This is not to put people to shame, but it's to say that, look, following Jesus means something. See, the purpose of scriptural depth is not to be scholarly, although some people are scholarly. The purpose of scriptural depth is to be Christ-centered and Christ-like. You know, there's folks there's folks who are atheists, but they teach in seminaries. They, there are some of them who know more of the Scripture than I do. But they're not drawing close to Jesus. And if you're not drawing close to Jesus, you're missing the point. You, who don't have a seminary degree, you, who don't necessarily have a call to preach or to pastor, you can go deep in the Scripture and see Jesus. You don't have to be deep to go deep. Jesus is seeable. Let's continue. So what I want to illustrate today is, and I've been saying it over and over again, but Old Testament saints were able to see Jesus from a distance with less revelation than we have today. So if they could see Jesus, why can't you see Jesus? This practice that began with old, uh, this is a practice that began with Old Testament believers. Let's look at 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11. It says this. It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It's speaking of the prophets who were searching, and I believe a lot of that searching was actually in the Scriptures. They had less Scripture to go off of, but they were looking in the Scripture. The, 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 the very Spirit of Christ was working in them to see the Christ in the Scriptures. We, we, we talked about some of those references in previous sermons in this series. We looked at, for example, the book of Isaiah and the prophecies there about him being, uh, uh, him being born and the government being upon his shoulder. And later in, in Isaiah talking about him dying on the cross. And these were prophets who were, de- they were inquiring about the, the, the seed of the woman. When is he going to show up? When is he going to deliver us? And they were trying to get an understanding of who Jesus was, searching diligently. Searching diligently, searching diligently. Guess what? We can have that same spirit. We can look at the word and search diligently. Search diligently what? To find Jesus. To find Jesus. We're not going to go there yet, but if you look at the Apostle Paul writing in the Philippians, he talks, I mean, who's more Christian than Paul? But he talks about, about pursuing Christ pressing toward the mark. He's, he, even though he is a Christian, he continues to diligently seek Christ and to know more of him, to see things more like Jesus, to be more like Jesus. The Spirit of Christ was working in Old Testament saints as they searched and inquired carefully for Christ in the Scripture. 
as they searched for Christ, they were modeling Christ. And I, we, we saw the list from Hebrews 11. It's in your notes. We looked at Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob, Jacob and Joseph. And the list goes on. It's in your notes. But you know what I'm talking about? The hall of faith in Hebrews 11. As Old Testament saints, they were uh, modeled Christ. They were participating in typology. I'm going to explain that briefly. Okay, so these Old Testament stories, they're not just stories. I mean, they are stories, but they are strategically uh, uh, placed in Scripture to reveal who Christ is. So you have these Old Testament saints like Joshua and Moses and Rahab and, and Sarah and Isaac and all these folks, but their lives are symbolically representing Christ even before he's born. That's how powerful this is, that they're just living their lives, not even, probably not even fully realizing that God is using him as his own reality show. He is the director and the script writer. And as they live their lives, you know how these reality show goes, they're scripted. <laughs> they want you to see a certain thing. They're not just going about their business, but they're scripted in a way so you see a particular thing. Well, God as the director, the Holy Spirit as the director, wants you to see a particular thing. And what is that? Jesus. He wants you to see Jesus, who is the culmination of all the promises, prophecies, and principles of Scripture. So if you see Jesus, you see everything. So let me expound a bit more about typology. And I'm quoting, I'm quoting here from gotquestions.org, uh, the question, what is biblical typology? It says this, typology is a special kind of symbolism. We can define a type as a prophetic symbol. Because all types, of represent are, all types are representations of something pointing to the future. More specifically, a type in Scripture is a person or thing in the Old Testament that foreshadows a person or thing in the New Testament. You see that? A type is a person or thing in the Old Testament that is foreshadowing or pointing to something in the New Testament. For example, the flood of Noah's day, right, is used as a type of baptism. And you see that in 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm not going to go there. But first, Peter talks about how the flood in Noah's day was a kind, a type of baptism. It was symbolic of the baptism we would encounter. The word for type that Peter uses is figure. And so when we say that someone is a type of Christ, we are saying that a person in the Old Testament behaves in a way that resembles the character or actions of Jesus in the New Testament. All right, there's examples of this. For example, Moses. In fact, the book of Hebrews is really important here because it compares Moses and Jesus and talks about how similar they are to each other. It compares Mo, uh, Jesus and Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. And in other figures of the Bible, you can see it in Abel. You can see that whole list of Hebrews 11 in, when, in which they are believing God. You can see them having aspects of the Christ that would eventually be born and deliver us. When we say that something is typical of Christ, we are saying that an object or event in the Old Testament can be viewed as representative of some quality of Jesus. So when we look at Joshua, for example, by the way, Joshua and Jesus have the same name. You don't know that because we, we, we use the Greek form of the name Jesus, but they're both named Yeshua. They're both called Yeshua, right? So, so uh, Yeshua, Joshua in the Bible is an obvious type of Christ. Abraham, right? Also a type right? All of these figures are types of Christ. So when you see them, ah, it's revealing Jesus to me and who he is. Let's continue. Scripture itself identifies several Old Testament events in, as types of Christ's redemption, including the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, and the Passover. We won't go over all these things. I just bring them out to just emphasize the fact that the Old Testament is speaking to us about Jesus. And these Old Testament saints could see it. The perceptive ones could say, wait a minute, this sacrificial system, it's more than just 
It's more, it's more than just goats and, and lambs and things. David was like, I'm, I, I, wait a minute, there's something more to this. Moses is saying, there's something more to this. He said, God, show me your glory. I want to see that. There, there, it's more than all these rituals and things you're having us to do. They are pointing to something greater. As Old Testament saints modeled Christ, they were expanding the Scripture. As they expanded Scripture, right, and by, by them expanding Scripture, we, their lives were documented in the text, and there's more things for us to read. As they expanded Scripture, they were also expanding our capacity to search for Christ. As Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Joshua and Rahab and Isaiah and all these folks lived their lives, uh, their lives became ways that we would see Jesus in their lives. So 1 Peter 1.10, uh, 1, 10 through 12, it says this, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves. Isaiah was saying he was serving not himself. It says, but they were serving not themselves, but you, but me, but us in the New Testament. Why? And that in the thing that they have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels look, uh, look into. In other words, some of them had the perception, I believe Isaiah was one of them, as he was writing, uh, and he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. I think he had the, re the, the realization that what he was documenting wasn't for him. It was for us to have a vision of Jesus, that he is our Savior, and guess what? He's our healer too. That the, the scope of that healing is not just spiritual, it's physical. And Isaiah was painting an image of him on the cross. He was bruised. He was chastised. He was wounded. 400 years, centuries before it happened, he was painting a picture for us to see. Unto us a child is born, a Savior is given. He's seeing it. He's painting the picture. So today, as we sing our Christmas carols and write our Christmas cards and have these cute little pictures, it's possible for us to see the Christ. Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 40, it says, And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. That is, they didn't see Jesus physically come to earth. They didn't have the benefit of having Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record his actions and his words. They didn't physically see him dying on the cross. They did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So we're connected. The fulfillment of their life work is in us receiving Jesus and seeing Jesus through their writings and their lives so that when we search the Scriptures, we see Jesus. When we look at Genesis, we see Jesus. And we look at Exodus, we see Jesus. And we look at Isaiah, we see Jesus. And Lamentations, we see. And Ruth and Esther, we see Jesus. They were becoming Scripture in the process of seeking the Christ they saw in Scripture. Their lives were literally turned into letters that we could read. And I'm going to give you, uh, Paul writes, explains this in a really wonderful way. In this instance, he's not talking about Old Testament saints. He's speaking about people that he's discipled, but it, the principle still applies. If you look here, 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 3, it says this, You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. Let me just pause there. The Bible, even the Old Testament, is a letter from Christ delivered to us. Revealing his mind, his heart. And he used people as his letters putting his imprint on their lives through the things they experienced and suffered and overcame and endured. He was showing himself. 
as Jeremiah was being persecuted for preaching, uh, for preaching, even in those experiences, right? Esther, through her obedience and delivering her people by being obedient to the Lord, all of these stories are pointing to Jesus. Verse 3 again, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So in reading their lives and letters, we are linked to a glorious tradition, searching diligently for Jesus in the Scripture. This is our tradition. This is our heritage, to search diligently for Jesus in the Scripture, to search diligently for Jesus in the Scripture to search diligently for Jesus in the Scripture. Reading a Bible every day is not some religious, I mean, it can be just a religious exercise to show how spiritual you are and how obedient you are and all those things, but you should be reading the Scripture day and night to find Jesus. The same spirit that was in the Old Testament believers enables us to see Christ in them as we meditate on the Word. Old Testament commands to meditate on the Word apply to us as much as it did to them. And it's, it's prolific the way it talks about it. For example, Joshua 1 and 8. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success day and night. Day and night. Day, and, just like our phones. I'm serious. Now, that's, just, that's basically what we do with our phones. We're on a day and night. You can't go a few minutes without... It's me too. I'm, I'm right there. <laughs> I do it too. And so during this fast, I'm going to be trying to address that, <laughs> to, 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 to recalibrate so that I'm quicker to go to the Scripture than I am to go to CNN. That the Scripture would be on my mind and my heart. That doesn't mean you can't use your phone. You don't have to be extreme about it. But it's the principle. It's the idea. Right? Psalms 1, 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates, what? Day and night. Day and night. And what does it say? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and his leaf does not wither, and all that he does prospers. You see that? Prosperity. But not the way some people derive it. It's a prosperity that's simply derived from Jesus. He is prosperity. We know Paul in in, 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 in Philippians, he says, whatever state I'm in, I know how to be content. Why? Because either way, I got Jesus. If I have money, if I don't have money, either way, I've got Jesus. I'm good. He nourishes me. That's why we do commune, to remind us that we're nourished by Jesus. Economy good, economy bad. Pandemic here, no pandemic. Jesus is still my source. You know, there was a time, particularly in the Word of Faith movement, maybe some people still do it today, people used to buy audios. (laughs) They used to buy them. There used to be a long line to to buy the sermon, and people would listen to it over and over and over. I'm not saying you got to do that, but what I'm saying, the attitude was, I'm going to get in that Word. I'm going to get in that word. I'm going to listen to it three, four, five times before the next sermon, right? That's not the only way you can do it, but I'm just talking about the attitude. The attitude. You're going to go get it. And what are you looking for? Jesus. Because in Jesus is healing, but everything else is peace, protection. And while you're believing God, while the, while the manifestation of your healing hasn't shown up yet, he's other things, folks. He's Jehovah Shalom. <laughs> you can have peace while, 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 you're, while you're enduring. <laughs> you can have peace. You can have joy. He's so many things. It's all found in Christ. I want to I point you to something here. There is a powerful Jewish tradition that begins in Deuteronomy, and it's connected to this tradition of meditating on the Word day and night, that draws on Old and New Testament saints, that draws Old and New Testament saints together to focus on Jesus in Scripture. It's called the Shema, the Shema. I'm going to be quoting from Timothy Mackey, 
uh, in a blog he wrote uh, called The Bible Project, but I think he explains this pretty well. Let me explain what the Shema is. The Shema refers to a couple of lines from the book of Deuteronomy, specifically Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, that became a daily prayer in ancient Israelite tradition. It's the equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, right? So in, in Christian tradition, the Shema gets its name from the first Hebrew word of the prayer in Deuteronomy. So hear, O Israel, or listen, right? That's where that word comes from. Listen or hear, or hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. He continues. In traditional Jewish practice, lines from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 were combined with other passages from the Torah, such as Deuteronomy 11, 13, Numbers 15, and they were prayed in the morning and the evening. In the morning and the evening. And this prayer has been one of the most influential traditions in Jewish history and functioned both as the Jewish pledge of allegiance and a hymn of praise. You kind of get the sense of how it was used in that regard. He continues, the declaration in this religious context has direct and far-reaching implications, okay? Because this prayer, basically in Deuteronomy, we're going to read it, it basically is saying the Lord our God is one God. The Lord our God is one God. Now, that may not be a big deal to you, but you got to understand that in ancient times, it, most people were religious, but most people it, were involved in polytheism. That is, that they worshiped several gods. That was the norm. So when God, when Jehovah says you worship one, that was revolutionary. People didn't worship like that, okay? But God says you just worship me, okay? What this meant to the persons coming under this claim is that no longer could there be different gods for different spheres of life. A God for the temple, another God of politics, a different God for fertility in the field, and yet another for the river, et cetera, et cetera. You understand these things. You're probably familiar with Greek mythology, for example. you got different gods for different things. This is very common around the world, different gods for different things. God says, no, one God, just like marriage, one person. You, you pick one. You pick one. Rather, um, he continues, and I'm, I'm quoting, at this point I'm quoting Alan Hirsch. The, the thing I just quoted was Alan Hirsch from the Forgotten Ways, page 88, continuing on that page. Rather, quoting from him, rather Yahweh is the one God who rules over every aspect of life and the world. Yahweh is Lord of home, field, politics, work, and the religious task was to honor this one God in and through all aspects of life. This is not only what constitutes the basis of worship, it is a call for the Israelites to live his or her life under the lordship of one God and not under the tyranny of the many gods. You see where this is going? You see where this is going? Let's continue. The Hebraic perspective, I'm quoting him, draws, links, draws and links every aspect of life to the eternal purposes of God. This is the intrinsic logic of the Torah. It is a natural extension of the claim of monotheism, namely that Yahweh is Lord. And this is the final thing I will quote from him. And this is where it connects, page 91 from Alan Hirsch's The Forgotten Ways. When the early church claims Jesus is Lord, it does so in precisely the same way and with exactly the same implications that Israel claimed God is Lord in the Shema. So we're going to look at Deuteronomy, and we're going to see this connection. When they say, our God is one Lord, the New Testament believers should think, Jesus. He is the Lord that brings together all of the things that I need. I don't need a separate God for this and a separate God for that. And if I go to this, I got to go to this person or this God. No, I go to Jesus, and I get the whole package, healing, protection, provision, peace. One God, Jesus the Lord, whose name is above every other name. And as I participate in that practice, I am joining the Old Testament saints in the same process of focusing on the Lord Jesus. When New Testament believers read Deuteronomy 6.4, they should see Jesus as its actual focal point. Let's read it, Deuteronomy 6.4. What does it say? Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's the goal, to seek God. But we know as New Testament believers, it's Jesus. 
Verse 6, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. That's the process. We're going to get into that shortly. We don't have much time. We're going to get into it. Verse 7, and what does it say? What does it say? And you shall teach them diligently to your children, <laughs> and you shall talk to them When you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. They didn't have it. They didn't have a mobile phone. They didn't have speakers. They didn't have things. They didn't have digital devices to repeat it over and over again. So they wrote it everywhere. They talked about it at dinner. They talked about it at breakfast. When they woke up, when they were saying their prayers, they were speaking the word. That hasn't changed, folks. So let's break that down briefly in the, in the next two to five minutes here, right? The goal, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6, 4, what? Is to love the Lord, which we know is Jesus. But cultivating that love is a process. Why? We got to put God's word on our hearts. We got to put God's word on our hearts. But how do we do that? There are steps. There are steps. What are the steps? Scriptural meditation, reading, talking, listening, pondering, reflecting day and night. Reading, talking, listening, pondering, reflecting day and night. Reading, talking, listening, pondering, reflecting day and night. Are you serious about healing? You serious about this? Reading, talking, listening, Pondering, reflecting day and night. Reading, talking, listening, pondering, reflecting day and night. To do what? To see Jesus. Final few statements here. The word feeds our spiritual immune system. Resisting sickness requires a healthy physical and spiritual immune system. When we meditate on the word day and night, we are taking daily doses of Jesus, our supernatural multivitamin. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the gift that you are to us not just on Christmas, Lord, but every day of our lives. There's some of you sitting here who have not received that gift. He's given it to you. In fact, he's, he's, he's wrapped it up, put, your, put a bow on it, has your name on it. He has given his life for you. But it's time for you to receive that gift. It's really simple. There's some of you today who may have never, ever maybe ever in your life committed to Jesus. And there's others of you sitting there that perhaps you've grown up in a Christian family, you've participated in Christian practices, maybe people consider you a Christian, but you know in your heart you've never personally made a commitment to Jesus yourself. And if that's you today, I I, I wanna give you, extend an opportunity for you to surrender to his lordship. And if that's something you'd like to do today, I want you to pray with me. There's a prayer I'm going to pray, and I'd like you to repeat after me. Here's the prayer. Dear God, I come to you now, and I surrender to Jesus. I accept him. I receive him. I submit to him as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, shed his blood, was buried, and then resurrected. And then at his resurrection, he broke the power of sin over my life. And because of that, he gave me the power to live a righteous life. Jesus, I receive you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Fill me with your spirit that I can live a life that is holy unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. We really need to celebrate right now. That's what the the Scripture says, that when someone comes to the Lord, that the angels in heaven celebrate. 
My heart is filled with joy for those of you who prayed that prayer because your life has just changed. What I'd like for you to do now is we want to come alongside you and support you, pray for you, connect you with other folks who are in the same journey. And so if you could text Zoe Saved to the number on your screen, that will give us the capacity to continue to support you and give you more ways to walk closely with the Lord. I want to thank everyone for joining us this Sunday, for tuning in. God is so good. And I just want to remind you that this is the season for receiving. But receiving from Jesus. It's the nourishment that we get from Jesus that will give us the capacity to nourish others. God bless you. God bless your Sunday. And enjoy this Christmas season.